Welcome back to Finfluence with Technicis. We are here to join today uh, with Marianne Francis. She is an associate partner uh, for digital banking at IBM Financial Service, an industry leader, representative, and speaker for thought leadership and the future of payment products, core and blockchain technologies. Um, I joined IBM in November of last year. Uh, I'm a legacy banker. Sometimes lately they say recovering banker. I noticed that's the new catchphrase because you're never an ex-banker, right? So I was in the retail side of the bank for 10 years and the commercial trade and treasury side, I ran the trade and treasury division for almost 20 years. So from there, I went to a Canadian firm um, as head of product and strategy. And then I was at Wipro for eight and a half years and then uh, DXC for almost three joining IBM to be part of their core banking and payments practice, which is, is a relatively new practice, actually. It was formed about a year ago now, uh, May or June of last year, where IBM sought to kind of go out and collect all of the myriad payments and core banking experts that they had and form what they're calling a center of competency. And um, so they've collected already existing ac uh, assets, and then they have brought in a lot of new assets like myself. Um, to really take uh, the IBM Payment Center and, and make it global. We've seen uh, during the last five years that the financial service industry has changed rapidly as a, at a fast pace. So uh, for us that, that we've been in, the, in this industry for more than 20 years, I've seen the internet uh, revolution, then the mobile you know, came along and then the multi-channel approach, the omni-channel approach, the, the, the digital and, and the digital experience. So how have you seen all this evolution that um, accelerated in the last five years, especially in the last one? Right, people had to be able to not just make payments, but they had to be able to work from home, you know, do a lot of stuff from a remote environment that they didn't have before. What I find interesting about the payment space that I've been in for a long, long time is that if you go back even further, there was only and is only still four payment rails, four payment types in the world, check, ACH, card, and wire. One could argue that some of the newer rails like for RTP and instant payments could be described, but they're still really not a new payment type. It's just a new rail. And so what's evolved over the last 20 years, to your point, is that it's kind of what I call lipstick on a pig. It's all of these applications and APIs and um, uh, uh, fintechs and you know the world's desire to talk to each other more, right? And, and the more cross-border payment flows that we have have necessitated and then taken advantage of the technology that's been developed. It's interesting that we still have a lot of challenges in the area, um, but I think it's because it's such a busy space, um, but it's also a growing space. Every year payments go up every year. Everybody makes payments. Everybody wants to make payments quickly. Everybody wants settlement and finality. Um, if there's one thing that the world has in common, it's real time. And it's interesting if you look at real time because you'd have real time, immediate, same day, instant. And there's another one, <laughs> but they're all trying to say, <laughs> like, it's like pick your definition of what you mean by that, right? Um, but that's yeah. one thing the whole world has in common is whether it's mandated by a government or a government entity, or it's just being sought after as from a, from a business case perspective, that's really had an impact on everything from the front end to the back end, because you might have a real-time payment rail in the United States, but if the Federal Reserve Bank doesn't settle on Saturdays and Sundays, we don't have real-time, yeah. yes. right? So it's a very complicated space. The dynamics of it evolving over all these years has been the fun part of being you know, a part of the, of the industry, but that's what I really have seen. And the proliferation of card and mobile, because we have so many people in the world that are unbanked and underbanked, um, has really exploded, you know, the use of, of, of mobile in a lot of either third world or evolving uh, com countries. And what do you think uh, we can learn here in the U.S. from experiences <laughs> in other countries that, that have moved uh, faster? Well, the U.S. is complicated for many, many reasons. One, sheer size, right? Not just geography, but what's the number? 10, 12, 14,000 financial institutions. 
the rest of the world doesn't have that, right? If you go to a Europe, there's five or, or a UK, there's five or seven major banks. Canada, five or seven major banks. South America, five or seven major banks. Australia, right? So the combination of they will, in my opinion, because I was on the workforce in Australia and I was part of, you know, looking at some of the real-time stuff in South America and, uh, and Brazil as well as in the Middle East, right? What happens in those geos is that there's a little bit, not a lot, but there's a little bit more team play. Whereas in the, the banks in the US are so diverse and so stratified that you have the big 10, you have the big 20, and then you have all the other banks, right? So the other part of the rest of the world is that there's a little bit more willingness to mandate, whereas the US is not really big on, on mandates in this space. They're, they're big on regulatory, but they're not big on, you will do instant payments by next November, which is very prolific in the other geographies, right? Um, and uh, where the central government will actually, you know, uh, the Saudi you know, government just rolled out with us, with IBM, you know, a real-time payment, you know, across the entire, you know, geo. And so when you have a central authority like that involved, sometimes it moves faster. Again, in the US, you have the Fed. That's a very labor intense, you know, risk averse, methodical approach, whereas- um, Oh yeah, and, and you know, <coughs> they, they have to take care of, of many, many banks. I, I remember yes. we, we have uh, Bank Original in Brazil was the first uh, full digital bank uh, in, in Latin America and Brazil. And, you know, they actually work it with uh, authorities to allow them to open accounts remotely without the physical presence of right. the customer. So they work for many months uh, trying to achieve that because their concept was, you know, um, a full digital bank. Right. So the, 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 the idea was not to have uh, the, the customers come into any branch because they were not going to have any right. branch and, and they were, Pretty successful. They they have now five million customers, so they grew uh, through the years uh, a lot, especially the last year. Mm -hmm. And but but yeah, I agree with with you. You know, they they work it with the with the authorities. Um, you know, in, in fact, Brazil uh, had <laughs> this uh, major uh, milestone at that time, and now you know, with the with the peaks, with it with the uh, that is the you know, the government but, payment, you know, uh, uh, service. So that's- Well, it was uh, interesting. I happened to be in Brazil in, it was September or October of 2019, right when the mandate came out, <clears throat> mm -hmm. right when they said a year from now, we're going to have instant payments. And I assure you, those of us sitting around the table at the various banks were all going, right, like, right, you're really going to do it in a year. Well, they did, right? Yeah. Um, you know, PIX is, is, you know, went up just about the time they said that it was going to. Um, and it was really good timing, not just because of COVID, but because, you know, very well, it's, it's a highly unbanked country, 40 to 45% yes, yes. are unbanked. Um, yes. And that's either by choice or which is underbanked versus unbanked, which, like you said, they don't want to go in the branch or they, they can't qualify. And it's also a very card centric uh, company, country. Um, and so if you're in a remote location or you don't want to go to the branch, they really needed other solutions. You know, to be able to help the population. What do you think the banks, this all this digital transformation, uh, and and everybody became becoming digital? It's uh, sort of putting everybody in the same space. You know, before when the branch was the was, was the the queen of the uh, banking service. You know the location of the branch, uh, the community uh, access. You know for for the bank to the community or for the community into bank was important. Now that everybody is on the digital space, um, we think that differentiation is key. You know, uh, so differentiation in the digital space. Uh, and what what do you think that differentiation should you know, have, you know, how, how the banks should uh, tackle that aspect? Well, peer differentiation is going to be client experience, right? And so what's happened, I think, is a little bit generational. 
um, you know, those of us at a certain age or below know nothing but phone or internet or mobile or online or e-commerce or whatever we've called all these things over the years, right? Yeah. You go to another generation, they still want to cash a check and talk to the teller. So as those generations, you know, I mean, I don't know if you remember back 10 or 15 years ago when everybody was moving to taking checks to images. The yes. fight was unbelievable. Where's my check? Why don't I have my check back? And what did you do with my check? And so, you know, that's almost completely gone now. Um, so it's, I think it's partly generational and then it's partly what technology is available. So I think from a true um, differentiation, it's going to be client experience, how easy everybody likes to use Uber as the experience, right? Don't even talk about the payment. Don't even, you know, um, I always used to jokingly say somewhat seriously, nobody gets up in the morning and says, gee, I'm going to go make a payment today, right? They're going to go buy something. They're going to go experience something. They're going to, right? And when they have to put their card in the machine four times or their pin is wrong or the POS is down, now you have this vastly different experience. But you look at how an Uber kind of service has made it invisible. You get in the car, you get out. Nobody talks about anything, right? So I think that that's why those have become, you know, so easy, but that's the differentiation piece to your, the other part of your question, which is transformation. Um, it, the, the industry might've made it a little bit more competitive by letting anybody do these front end things, FinTech APIs to my earlier point about lipstick on a pig, but you get to the bigger, uh, older, more legacy situations. Now it's not level anymore, right? Because those guys are very heavy. Uh, the big banks and, and the big corporates are very heavy in legacy systems, in patchwork systems because they've acquired, um, in systems that are running 50, 60% of their budgets for BAU. Those are the folks that are really also looking for transformation internally. In internally. Um, and they have a little bit more spaghetti to deal with. And so it's a much more expensive proposition for them to transform themselves um, than it is for some of the newer or the smaller institutions. Going back to differentiation and what you mm -hmm. talk about the different generations, uh, we have an experience with a, with a Canadian bank, uh, Brightside and a new initiative. They were, uh, they are focused on the younger generation yep. and they, uh, with an offer that uh, helped the customers to, to save. You know, they, they can, you know, every time they spend, they can save the, mm -hmm. the change, you know, into a savings account and then they can access to that money if they want or, uh, or not, you know. So, so in, in certain way, it's a, a savings um, um, oriented offering, yeah. you know, at the beginning. Uh, what, what do you think of, of the bank with that role of helping people manage their finances you know it's either allowing uh reduce their payment expenses or uh getting them on track uh with uh, savings or with uh, their day-to-day -day finance well it's very I, i think it's actually very clever because it kind of starts to talk about the open banking world in some cases right but secondly it's not intrusive So it's not an email that says, you know, meet with one of my financial planners or, you know, I want to cross sell you with private banking or, right? It's a very non-intrusive, very helpful to your, use your words, um, creative. Nobody's, nobody's going to pay attention to a dollar here or a dime there. They should, but, you know, and then that, that adds up. And so um, there was a bank in Brazil that did something very similar, Joanne, and the name escapes me, but they went solely for the millennial group. Um, but yeah. they did, yeah, uh, it could be, yeah. Um, but it was just very interesting because they were very targeted in who they were going after. Um, the messaging was very clever and clear to that generation. And it became just a nicety, right? Not a necessity, um, but a nicety that turns into something very valuable. And um, so I think that's the kind of creative thinking client experience, you know, that we're both talking about other than, you know, if, if, If you make buy something on your phone and you use PayPal or Apple, you, you just assume it's going to work. Nobody wants to think about how it's going to work. It's just going to work, right? Yes. 
Um, and so I think when you can make it back to my Uber, when you can make it a non-thinking, non, yeah, you know, right. very normal part of the transaction, I think that's seamless, easy. yeah, seamless and easy, right? So I think that that's the key. Um, and again, the generations are much more attuned to that. But I can tell you that nobody, no millennial knows how their phone works. They and they don't want to know. Like people like no. us, we were like. How does that work? How does the system work? How does, you know, it was always, let's, yeah. let's understand what's in the background, right? Um, yes. Today's people don't, they just want the phone to turn on. They want to get a, a notice that their transaction's been complete and it's secure. And then they want to go back. Cause like I said, even though we find payments exciting, uh, most people don't really think about their payments. Yes. You know? just, yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. yeah. Now the only <laughs> exception to that I'll take back is, is business corporate to corporate. Um, B2B, because those guys still have a lot of challenges, right? ERP oh, yeah. systems are old. An astonishing number of checks are still written. You know, can't buy a car on Sunday. Depends on which country you're in, but can't do a stuff on Saturday and Sunday or at nine o'clock at night, right? Um, yes. So that's, that's still a challenge that I think is more so in the B2B space um, than it is in the consumer space. In the same line of, of customer experience and uh... Uh, and differentiation, offering differentiation uh, and putting the, the customer in the center. Uh, what do you think is the role of AI? You okay. know, something that, that is now uh, not only a buzzword, but, but something really powerful. To and it's turning even more powerful, right? Yeah, so it's, it's uh, you know, it, it's one of the two or three top factors. I think for the future to, to, to truly be that differentiator because um, used appropriately, AI now becomes this enormously valuable analytic tool, right? Um, again, go back to open banking and who wants to play because um, right now open banking is mostly opt-in everywhere. That's, that's one of the things open banking has, you know, they've, that's not been, to my recollection, that's not been mandated anywhere. Um, well, maybe the UK is a little exception there, but um, that's where I just see the, the ability to have smart, you know, smart tracking uh, analytics. I mean, we, we've seen it to some degree, right? After you buy something and then for the next three weeks, you'll get a pop-up and you may like, you like this or you may like that, right? Um, so that was kind of the beginning of the tracking, um, but it felt intrusive to people like they were being spied on, right? So the yes. secret to good AI is that it's just intelligent data. I, used, I like to say it's not data, it's information. Like we are data rich everywhere we go. There's a ton of data, but mm -hmm. turning it into useful information is a completely different story, right? And yes. so I think that's the, that's the real key and the demand we see from our customers for it is huge. And so I, I, I just think on a global scale, AI cloud um, are definitely, you know, the super focus of the next five to 10 years. And then I, I've been a blockchain aficionado for a very long time and it's, slowly, slowly being better understood and better utilized. And I'd put blockchain in that category as well, you know, as um, it, was mis it was totally misunderstood. And for the first five years, it was nothing but crypto, right? Unless you were truly in the space, you didn't understand blockchain. Um, so I think those tools together, because one brings you trust and security, that's the blockchain. Yes. One brings you analytics and valuable information and the other allows you to function without it being in your back end. Right. You don't have to have a floor. You don't have to have a server. You don't want maybe, you know what I mean? You don't have to be heavy um, inside uh, because now you can manage it by by having it in the cloud. So I think those three things are huge for the for the future. What would be your number one piece of advice for a bank that that is uh, facing this uh, challenge of transformation? I, I might have two. <laughs> okay, that's fine. <laughs> number one, well, and I'm going to put it in order that I, I typically do. Number one, what are you good at? Why are you good at it, right? Is it because of good processes, good people, good location, you know, why? And then, but is that what you want to be good at, right? And my example is always, you might be the best check processor in the world. Who wants to be the best check processor in the world, right? <laughs> so that leads to my second question, which is what don't you want to do anymore, right? Yeah. You're doing stuff that you might have to do, but maybe somebody else could do that for you and do it better and allow you to free up dollars, resources for innovation. Um, so I really do love to ask, 
you know, FIs that question, what, what don't you want to do anymore? Because that's where the cloud really comes in. That's where managed services comes in, right? Um, that's where you can begin to transform your bulky back end. Like nobody's going to rip and replace their whole core. Nobody. Okay. Maybe a small institution, but they don't, you know. Um, but you can slowly peel away at it, right? You can slowly move some of those core functions out, which is why I say five to seven years, right? Slowly. And then this is a fresh, new, shiny layer. It's got no baggage, right? Um, and then if you move into the smaller markets, you can, br you can bring things like fraud protection and, and um, uh, keeping up with regulations easier, freeing up dollars to innovate easier, right? So the downstream benefits of, of figuring out what you don't want to do, what somebody else could do for you is really huge, I think. And I, I, I do spend a lot of time talking to banks like that, but I really do like to ask them what they don't want to do anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's smart. And they're like, honestly, 90% of them will say nobody's ever asked me that before. Yeah. Right. Nobody's ever asked me that. I was like, I was a banker. I can tell you exactly what I didn't want to do. <laughs> <laughs> I needed somebody to hand, you know, to hand it off to, you know. Yes. Well, that that's great, and uh, thank you very much for for your time today. Sure. Uh, Pleasure. Very happy, you know, to have you here in our uh, podcast, and and well, look forward to. Well, and we're IBM's very anytime. happy to have you as a partner. So. Yes, of course. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.